Hi all, and welcome back to Professor Trulove's Concepts for Nurses series. We are still in the neurological section, Problems with the Brain, and in this episode we will be discussing meningitis and encephalitis. I am Professor Terry Trulove. Our sources for this episode will be Iggy's Medical Surgical Nursing, 9th edition, as well as Soul, Introduction to Critical Care Nursing, 7th edition. By the end of this podcast, you should be able to differentiate between meningitis and encephalitis, despite their similarities. We start with meningitis. Meningitis is an inflammation of the meninges surrounding the brain and spinal cord. The patient with an infection in the head or neck has an increased risk for meningitis because of the proximity of anatomical structures. The causes of meningitis are bacterial and viral organisms that are often the most responsible, although fungal meningitis and protozoal meningitis can also occur. Viral meningitis is usually self-limiting and the patient has a complete recovery but bacterial meningitis is potentially life-threatening. Symptoms associated with meningitis include decreased or a change in level of consciousness, disorientation to person, place, and year, pupil reaction and eye movements, including photophobia, nystigmus, and other abnormal eye movements, changes in motor response, uh, normal early in the disease process. However, Hemiparesis, hemiplegia, and decrease in muscle tone is possible later. Cranial nerve dysfunction, especially cranial nerves 3, 4, 6, 7, and 8. Memory changes, including attention span changes, which usually shortens. Personality and behavior changes. Bewilderment. Severe, unrelenting headaches. Generalized muscle aches and pain. Nausea and vomiting fever and chills, tachycardia, and a red, a red macular rash, which is known as meningococcal meningitis. So CSF is used to help diagnose meningitis, and CSF can cause increased intracranial pressure as a result of blockage of the flow of the cerebral spinal fluid, the change in cerebral blood flow, and thrombus formation. Seizure activity may occur when meningeal inflammation spreads to the cerebral cortex. The effects of aging and meningitis should be noted as well because people who are older than 60 years of age or who are immunocompromised or have signs of increased ICP usually should have a CT scan before obtaining cerebral spinal fluid from a lumbar puncture. To increase patient safety, the most important assessment and the most important interventions for patients with meningitis are accurately monitoring and documenting their neurological status. And this includes vital signs and neurovascular checks, also to observe for early signs and symptoms of increased intracranial pressure. As for infection control, Standard precautions are appropriate for most patients with meningitis unless the patient has a bacterial infection that is transmitted by droplets. Individuals ages 16 through 21 years have the highest rates of infection from life-threatening Neisseria meningococcal infection. For that reason, teach these people about vaccination. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention recommends an initial meningococcal vaccine between ages 11 and 12 years with a booster at age 16. Also, remember to encourage people in areas of high population density, such as college dormitories and crowded living areas, to become immunized against meningococcal meningitis. To confirm the diagnosis and the source, Laboratory assessment of men- meningitis includes cerebral spinal fluid analysis, CAT scan, blood cultures, counter immunoelectrophoresis, or CIE, to determine a, 
whether the source is protozoa or viral, polymerase chain reaction, complete blood count, and x-rays to determine the presence of infection. Prioritize care to maintain airway, breathing, and circulation. Take vital signs and perform neurologic checks every two to four hours or as required. Perform cranial nerve assessments. Manage pain with drugs and non-medication methods. Perform vascular assessments and monitor for those changes. Give medications such as antimicrobials and corticosteroids. Record intake and output carefully. Maintain fluid balance. Make sure that you maintain body weight. Identify fluid retention early. Provide a private room with dim light under droplet precautions if necessary. Monitor for increased intracranial pressure. Maintain seizure precautions if necessary. Perform a range of motion exercises every four hours as needed. Decrease your environmental stimuli and monitor for and prevent complications. Medication therapy can be everything from broad, broad spectrum antibiotics, antimicrobials such as antivirals and antifungals, hyperosmolar agents for increased intracranial pressure, as are anticonvulsants and steroids, and steroids are controversial. Although they do decrease the inflammation, they encourage infection because of their suppression of the immune system. Lastly, think about prophylactic treatment for those who are in close contact with the meningitis infected patient. Now we'll talk a little bit about encephalitis and we will review the pathophysiology, causes, preventative measures, physical assessment, drug therapy, and complications. Encephalitis is an inflammation of the brain tissue in often the surrounding meninges, affecting the cerebrum, the brainstem, and the cerebellum. Unlike meningitis, this response does not cause exudate, or pus, formation. Encephalitis is most often caused by a viral agent elsewhere in the body, although bacteria, fungi, or parasites may be involved. Viral encephalitis can be life-threatening infection that leads to persistent neurologic problems such as learning disabilities, epilepsy, memory loss, and fine motor deficits. In severe cases of encephalitis, the patient may exhibit increased intracranial pressure resulting from cerebral edema, hemorrhage, and necrosis of brain tissue. The typical patient with encephalitis has a high fever and reports nausea, vomiting, and a stiff neck. Other symptoms include changes in mental status, motor dysfunction, for instance, dysphagia, focal, that is, specific neurologic deficits, photophobia and phonophobia, fatigue, joint pain, headaches, and vertigo. Herpes zoster may be a cause of encephalitis, and the lesion is clinically manifested by a rash, severe pain, itching, burning, or tingling in the areas innervated by those nerves. Assess the level of consciousness as a priority in patients with encephalitis using the Glasgow Coma Scale. Lumbar puncture and diagnostic analysis of cerebral spinal fluid may be helpful depending on the patient's condition. Supportive nursing care and prompt recognition and treatment of increased intracranial pressure are essential components of management. Drug therapy is most effective if begun early, before the patient becomes stuporous or comatose. No specific drug therapy is available for infection by arboviruses or enteroviruses. Encephalitis patient education includes teaching older adults and those with chronic illness to have influenza and pneumonia vaccines. Since encephalitis can be caused by certain types of bites, teach people who enjoy outdoor activities to avoid areas where mosquitoes and ticks are likely to populate, especially near lakes and wooded areas. If they are in contact with those areas, remind them, especially older adults, to use insect repellent and keep skin exposure to a minimum. 
So when comparing meningitis and encephalitis, remember that encephalitis is an inflammation of the brain, whereas meningitis is inflammation of the meninges. The most common cause of both is a virus. Cerebral edema, hemorrhage, and necrosis of brain tissue can occur. Fever, headache, nuchal rigidity, photophobia, irritability, lethargy, nausea and vomiting are typical symptoms. Differentiating the two requires close assessment and using diagnostic tools to determine sources and causes. That concludes this podcast. Stay tuned, however, because the neurological series continues with the next podcast. Take care.